My girlfriend nearly didn't get a seat. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. Really appreciate it. It's such an honor to be on such an incredible cruise with such incredible people. I've had so many good conversations and met so many cool people. And I just want to say thanks to everyone who made my experience so awesome. And I'm sure there's so many people here who made it awesome for each other. So let's all just give ourselves a round of applause. <laughs> a few years ago, about four or five years ago, actually, I did not care about animals. I did not grow up being an animal lover. I didn't even like animals. I did not like them. I thought they were smelly and dirty and hairy and disgusting. I didn't like them. And so much has changed because, you know, if you saw the title of the talk, 365 Day Vow of Silence for the Animals, that's what I did. I went from not liking animals and trying to actively avoid them to taking a year-long vow of silence to raise awareness for them and to promote peace over violence, which is the opposite of what is happening to the animals on this planet today. So I want to tell you what changed for me, what I learned, what happened, and hopefully you'll make some similar connections. And I'll be open, uh, if I've got time, does anyone know how long I've got? One hour. Oh jeez, okay, forget what I was gonna say about questions after, there'll be no time for that. We're not even gonna squeeze this into an hour. Uh, but for me, it's interesting, it all started on a celebrity cruise ship. On a celebrity cruise ship. Somebody told me that eating animals is bad karma. And I've been somebody who got interested in the health side of things because I was a personal trainer. I'd been very sick when I was 17. I was diagnosed with leukemia and lymphoma. And that person who helped me, apart from the doctors who helped me lose the 50 pounds that I'd put on during that time, he was a personal trainer. I became a personal trainer on the ships. I wanted to help people the way that he'd helped me because he'd actually done more than just help me lose some weight. He'd helped me out of my suffering. And I truly suffered a lot when I was 17 when I had that cancer. So I wanted to, I wanted to pay it forward. I became a personal trainer. I worked on these ships. And a very wise old man said to me, well, I was just trying to bludge work. I'm like, hey, let's have a conversation. You're allowed to talk to the passengers. I didn't want to have to do all the work. So I talk to this guy every day. On the last day, he tells me eating animals is bad karma. And I was like, well, I must have some real bad karma. I eat some sort of animal every single meal. If my meal, if my plate doesn't have an animal on there, I, that's not a meal to me, that's the pre-meal snack. I, I would never eat meals like that. Every single meal, for as long as I can remember, would have some sort of animal on it. He said eating animals is bad karma. I went to my go-to line, which is something I believed from someone who had mentored me when I first became a personal trainer seven years prior. This person said to me, there's no such thing as a healthy vegetarian. All the doctors would be like, who was that man? That guy don't know what he's talking about. I believed that for all the years I was a personal trainer. So I said that to the men, eating animals is bad karma. There's no such thing as a healthy vegetarian. He said, I've been vegetarian for 20 years. I said, you're lucky to be alive. You should be dead. And he wasn't the picture of health, you know? We were on a cruise ship, not everyone here is the picture of health. But he was alive. For me, that was a big thing. Okay, maybe it's possible. And he was wise. He taught me so much in the two weeks that I'd spent speaking to him. I thought, you know what, maybe I'll try it. Maybe I'll try it just for seven days. I won't eat meat just to see what happens, just to see how I feel. And three days in, I already noticed improvements. I already felt better after eating. I felt strong. I felt happier, strangely. I just, maybe it was placebo, I don't know. But if you knew how much meat I was eating before, see most of us were eating at the black crab, we're having those little portions, we're eating nice, you know, eating mindfully, having a chat. I was going to the buffet, I was loading up a pyramid of meat on my plate. As much as I get, I'd be, I'd be walking and there'd be meat dropping all off my plate. That's how I would eat, I was making the most of the buffet, that's what I thought I was doing. So no wonder in three days my body was rewarding me, good, don't do that anymore, you'll feel so much better. So I got excited, I started searching for more answers. Can I sustain this feeling? Can I help my clients and my family feel like this? You know, what's going on? And I was shocked to realize after a bit of research, a bit of research, it was all right there waiting for me all this time. 
Before, before long at all, I learned that not only can we be healthy without eating any animal products, but we're likely to live a longer life. We, you might add 10, 20, 30 years to your life by not eating animal products and reducing your chances of developing the most serious diseases that humans are faced with, like heart disease and cancers and diabetes and obesity and osteoporosis and the list goes on and on and on. And I thought, how did I not know about this? I've been personal trainer for eight years. I thought I knew what I was talking about, but I didn't. Vegetarians would come to me and say, yeah, I'm a vegetarian, can you do a meal plan? I said, yeah, with a lot of meat in it. Because you can't eat like that. No such thing as a healthy vegetarian. So I got so excited, I started sharing the love. I became one of those vegetarians, which is pretty much every vegetarian. It's like, man, you know, you've got to go vegetarian. What are you doing eating meat? You got to, everybody needs to go vegetarian. It's so much healthier. And people are like, dude, I saw you eating steak for breakfast three days ago. What the hell are you talking about? I said, no, no, but I've learned so much since then. Everything has changed. And it was so weird because I was so shut off to the information. I remember that it had trickled in before. I remember one time I watched this, this YouTube video of this, a um, person put two pork chops in a pan and then they poured Coca-Cola over it oh. and it fizzed and then these, I don't know, these parasites came out of it. These worms started squirming out. And I was like, what the hell is that? But that's not my meat. That's this guy's meat. I don't know where this guy's buying his meat from, but I don't buy my meat from where that guy gets his meat from. My meat doesn't do that. So I was always just closed off. Why would I... Why would I take in any information about the benefits of a plant-based diet if I was never, ever gonna be on one? That's what I thought. But I was feeling good. After a few days, I was eating good food, which surprised me. I thought I was just gonna eat lettuce and tofu. I thought that was it. I'm having curries and burgers, all just, the, you know, at the time it was vegetarian stuff. And I got really excited. I started telling everybody. And soon later, it wasn't before long that I realized there's more to the story. Everyone online, I'm researching like crazy about this. Everyone online saying, yeah, yeah, the health's great. That's a great bonus. But this is about the animals. I'm vegetarian for the animals. And I was like, cry me a river. Who cares? <laughs> They're just animals, you know, whatever. Why would you change your life for the animals? And I didn't get it at all. But everyone's telling me, watch Earthlings. Watch the documentary Earthlings. Like, Earthlings? Sounds pretty chill. <laughs> <laughs> it's not chill. I tell you what it is if you don't already know. Earthlings is like a real life horror movie. It shows all the ways that humans exploit, confine, and kill animals for food, for clothing, for entertainment, and for medical testing shows what we do to them. It's brutal. They scream. It's so graphic and bloody. It truly is like the worst horror movie you've ever seen. But it's reality. And it was reality then and it's reality now. And I saw this. And it made me ask myself the question, okay, am I a compassionate person? I like to think so. I try to be. Am I respectful? Am I peaceful? Am I loving? Am I a non-violent person? Yes. I strive to be across the board, and I think non-violence should be really the, the most core value that almost everyone holds, because that's the worst thing, to be violent to someone who doesn't deserve it, to be violent at all. That should be the thing we're trying to reduce the most on this planet, unnecessary, easily avoidable violence. And I ask myself the question, if we don't need to kill and eat these animals to survive and thrive, which I just learned, then what do we do this to them for? I thought there must be a good reason because everybody hates animal cruelty and most people love animals. 98%, 99% of people would say I'm, I'm against animal cruelty. I think unnecessary animal cruelty is wrong. So, okay, that's what I believe too. But what I've learned is that I was, I was still contributing to it in a, in a massive way that I'd never really considered before because I always thought it was necessary. In fact, my brother showed me slaughterhouse footage once. He said, you'll never eat meat again. And I watched it and I said, 
That's sad for them, kind of. I really didn't care that much, to be honest. I, I felt nothing. I felt nothing when I saw that slaughterhouse footage. Because then I said to him, if you want to feel guilty about that, that's fine. But I'm not going to feel guilty about being a human. I need to eat meat to survive. Totally different perspective when I watch Earthlings. I've been thriving, not eating meat. And I've been learning so much that it's so much better. So the confusion was so strong because I had no idea why we could, how we could justify this, especially as a society of people who strive to reduce violence. Violence is the worst thing. And, and also claim to be against animal cruelty. So I was really confused. So I was vegetarian in that moment for a whole other reason, for the animals. So I start telling everybody that. You know how I was telling you that I was vegetarian the other day for health? There's so many benefits, I've learned a hundred more. I can't wait to tell you them all. <laughs> but, but, have you ever thought about what happens to an animal before they become that neatly wrapped package on the supermarket shelf? And most people were like, don't tell me, man. I don't want to know. Don't spoil my dinner. And I was like, I'm going to spoil your dinner. Right now. <laughs> you tell me the other day you're against animal cruelty. You're going to spoil all your meals. <laughs> and <laughs> this Indian man who I met on the cruise ship, he wasn't done with me. You know, that was like the last day after two weeks of speaking to him, eating animals is bad karma. He also told me after I said, how do you know all this information? He's so wise. He was like an Indian guru kind of style guy. Reminded me of the Buddha. And he said, I said, how do you know all this? He said, meditation. I was like, oh yeah, cool. Like, <laughs> so you just sat in the corner and closed your eyes and you figured it out. And he's like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I suppose I should do that then. So I book in for a meditation course. And you know, most people, they, maybe they start oh, meditation, all right, I'll start. They do 10 minutes in the mornings, whatever. I book in for a 10 day silent meditation course. You don't speak for 10 days, you meditate for 10 hours a day. I don't know what I was thinking on that one. I get off the cruise ship, I get home. Everyone's calling me, are you okay, man? I'm like, what, yeah, what do you mean? We heard you went vegetarian. <laughs> like, you're going to be vegetarian soon too. I'm going to watch this documentary with you. You're going to change your life forever. And I get onto the meditation course and I'm meditating. I'm day one, day two, I'm in pain. I'm hating it. It's the worst thing I've ever done. Day five, I'm like, okay, five more days you can get through this. And halfway through day five, I have this very strong sensation come over my body. I didn't know what was going on. And eventually it passed. And I started thinking, what the hell just happened? And it was like my body was trying to get me to speak. It was like something needed to come out of my mouth and I needed to speak. And I, you know, I just observed it, did the practice, did the technique. And I started thinking, whoa, I haven't spoken in five days. That's pretty cool. I wonder how long I could do this for. Imagine doing another week. Imagine doing another month. Imagine doing a whole year. And the problem with meditation, the danger that they don't warn you about, is that when you meditate, you get real positive and all your ideas seem like good ideas. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, of course. Year-long vow of science, that's a great idea. I'm thinking, but how am I going to make this work? I can't get home from my cruise ship and be like, guess what, everybody, I've gone vegetarian. People were freaking out, actually. Something happened to them on that ship. I can't get back from the meditation and be like, one more thing, <laughs> not talking for next year. They were gonna be like, has he been, what's, is he? Been? So I thought I need some sort of reason. I need some sort of, you know, what can I do this for? Maybe I could do it to raise awareness for something I care about. What do I care about? Well, my, new, my passion for helping others, since, especially since I was sick, was very strong. That's why I was a personal trainer. I really loved my job. But my newfound passion for speaking up for the animals was very strong. Because what I felt like had happened is I had awoken to a massive, massive injustice happening everywhere that almost everyone is a part of, me included for all those years until just a few months prior to this moment. Everyone. And the victims of violence are right in front of us three times a day and we don't even see them. We don't even see it like that. And this is the longest lasting form of oppression of all time. 
with the greatest number of victims by far, by far. So I feel like I've woken up to the biggest thing happening on this planet in terms of violence. I had, I still agree with that. And it, it, it made me feel like a duty to tell others about it, you know? So I thought maybe I could do this vow science to raise awareness for the animals. They're voiceless, I'll be voiceless. That works, good enough. But is this a big enough cause? You know, I keep telling people and they're like, shut up man, I don't care. And I'm like, but you're an animal lover. You have like six dogs and like 15 cats. What is, what, why are you eating cows? And I thought, okay, this, I need to do more research. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe it's not as big a deal as I thought. I look into the reasons why people consume animal products. I learned that the best justifications we've got are taste, habit, tradition, and convenience. Straight away, I knock all them out. None of them are good enough justifications for the horror show that we inflict on the most innocent and vulnerable beings. I start looking, maybe it's better environmentally. Maybe we have to eat animals for an environment. I straight away learn animal agriculture is the leading cause of most of the destructive things happening to our planet today. Leading cause of deforestation and species extinction, habitat loss, ocean dead zones, greenhouse gas emissions, water wastage, water pollution, land usage, and the list goes on and on and on. They estimate by the year 2048 that we know fish in this ocean, and there are more greenhouse gas emissions produced by the methane that comes out of cows than by every single transportation device on this planet. I thought, okay, well, it's definitely not better for the environment. In fact, it's crucial that for the sustainability of life on this planet, we change and we, we, do, we do rid of this completely. Otherwise, we're just gonna get ourselves into a point where we are going to war over water in countries that currently are affluent and have no issues like that. I go back to the health where I first started I got so excited the more and more I learned about the health benefits of not eating animal products. I, I've got family members who are sick. You know, I, I've got friends who I don't, I don't want to get sick. And I thought this is such a powerful tool. Simply changing what we buy at the supermarket can add decades to our life and reduce our chances of getting all these diseases and suffering and getting on these medications and getting our chest opened up and all these very real issues that the majority of people we know will get and die from decades before their time when they didn't have to. This is what the majority of people are dying from. I was so excited to learn about that. But the biggest thing that was pushing me was the animals. I kept coming back to the animal issue because what we're talking about, when we're talking about the animals, we're talking about over one billion, a thousand million animals, land animals, every single week that are being mutilated and tortured and killed for foods and products that not only we don't need, but we're far better off without. And that's, that's over a billion land animals a week. It's about 76 billion land animals a year. And it's about 2.7 trillion sea animals. Now we all have our biases because of the conditioning we need meat for protein, we need dairy for calcium, fish don't feel pain. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of reasons why we aren't already onto this because we've been conditioned to believe a certain way, just like I was, just like everyone I speak to is. We all believe, even all around the world, we all believe the same lies. For doctors to actually be telling people, no, you must eat, you must eat meat, go back to eating meat. If you've got a little cold, go eat more meat. This is a really serious problem that the people we go to for our medical advice are telling us to eat the very things that are making us sick and killing us. They don't know. So we're talking about trillions, trillions of innocent beings killed every year. And these animals, we think they're so different to us, but they're not. We are animals too. Humans are animals too. We all feel pain and suffer want to live and don't want to die. That alone, that similarity alone, should be enough reason for us to respect their lives and let them do what they want to do without ending their lives prematurely because we feel like a snack. That alone should be it. But we have so much <coughs> in common. We all have a heart, we all have a brain, we have eyes, ears, nose, mouth. We have a family, we have communities. We communicate. We communicate pigs 
They have 30 different expressions with their mouth and when they add their body language, it goes up to 90 different ways of communicating with other pigs. All animals are like this and have their ways. Humans obviously think we're up here. Because we're humans, we want to think we're the best. And we do some incredible things. But we should never judge other species based on can they do a great math equation? Can they do an incredible orchestra? Can they go on a cruise ship? They are insignificant reasons to value somebody's life or not. All species feel pain, suffer, want to live and don't want to die. And that's all that really matters. They all care for their young. They all, they all, they have so much in common with us because we are them. They are our brothers and our sisters. We've waged a war. They are, they, are, they are our family on this planet. We have waged a war on them to the point where the worst offenders on this planet, the worst child abuser, the worst sex offender, the worst serial killer, they do not get treated anywhere near as badly as we treat these innocent, vulnerable, precious beings. Not even close. So I was like, right, I'm all in. This vow of science, I've got 2.7 plus trillion reasons to take this vow of science for the animals. And I started doing more research. I knew, people always ask me, where do you get protein? I'm like, oh, I don't know, try lentils. People were saying, what about humane slaughter? I was thinking, maybe, maybe that's better. Like, I had no idea the answer. I had all the same questions too. I realized I had to research. And I started getting the answers. Where do you get protein? Protein is found abundantly in all plant foods. If you're getting enough calories, by default, you're getting enough protein. The benefit of getting protein from plants is you get it without the cholesterol, the saturated fat, the hormones, the high concentrated doses of antibiotics and pesticides, and so many other benefits. People are saying, what about humane slaughter? There's no humane way to kill somebody who doesn't want to die. How can you compassionately, which is what humane means, how can you compassionately murder? That's what it is. We call it slaughter, but the action is the same. Deliberately taking the life of someone who did not want to die. Basically murder, I don't see any difference. Any difference, apart from species, the action is the same. How do you compassionately murder? Can you compassionately abuse a child, humane child abuse? No, and we can't humanely murder either. I got a brother who I love, and I treat him well, I have every single day in my life. I let him free range all day long. And then one day, <laughs> and then one day, in his sleep, boom. Didn't see it coming, didn't feel a thing. Can I say to the judge, relax, humane murder, never heard of that? And he's gonna be like, what the hell are you talking about? 20 years, hopefully more. Same with the animals. Humane slaughter, what an oxymoron. Those words do not belong together. And, and they've done such a great job of convincing us that they do. No, you can be an animal lover and pay for them to get stabbed in the throat. Of course you can still be an animal lover. Doesn't sound like an act of love to me. Doesn't sound like an act that anybody I know ever in my life would be okay with if they really thought more about it because almost everyone I know are peaceful, non-violent people. Actively avoiding violence or trying to stop it if they see it. You see an animal getting abused, you go over there and help it. Hey, what do you think you're doing? That's what we do in the morning, and then later in the day we buy a bacon burger, and what we're doing is the total opposite of what we did. We're saying, hey, can I have a bacon burger? But what you're really saying, you're saying is, hi, can you forcibly impregnate an animal, and then breed them and take the babies away from the mother, and then when the mother's fat enough, can you murder her for me, and then chop her up into pieces, and put her in a packet of plastic so I can make a burger out of it? Like that's what you're asking for if that's what we're buying. It, it's not just you're buying a packet, you're paying for everything. You're creating a demand for animal agriculture and animal agriculture is inherently cruel and immoral. There's no nice way to do it. There's no humane murder. There's no free range. Free range isn't the answer. That's like saying that you can have slaves as long as they have a lot of space. No, they've got a nice room. I don't see the problem. We play music for them every day. No, it's not about looking for the right way to do the wrong thing. The lesser of two evils is still evil. Yes, it's better if we don't torture them first. That's better. 
But murder is still wrong. Murder is still wrong, especially when it's completely unnecessary and avoidable. So I start learning the answers to all these questions. And then, finally, I realized in a moment, because I was talking to my cousin. She said, what's this vow of silence you're doing? You know, skeptical as everybody was, as I was too. What's this vow of silence you're doing? I said, I'm, take, I'm gonna take a vow of silence for the animals, travel around Australia and write a blog. And hopefully some people are interested in that and I can teach them some things about the stuff I'm passionate about. And I was telling her what a great thing I was about to do for the animals while I was eating a piece of cheese. And the only time I've been glad that the dairy industry is so good at keeping secrets, because I thought, okay, I know I'm being a hypocrite right now, but she doesn't know I'm being a hypocrite. <laughs> but the thing is that there is at least as much cruelty in dairy, in eggs, in leather, wool, silk, in all animal products. In all animal products. It's easy to see with meat. It's been cut off someone's body, and they are a someone, they're not a thing. They're a someone, they're an individual. Each animal, like us, is an individual. It's been cut off someone's body, put on a plate. Obviously, they suffered and died. When we're talking about eggs, when we're talking about dairy, it's in this nice bottle, this nice carton, I should say. On the front, there's a little picture, happy looking cow, usually a cartoon. And yeah, that's what we drink, it's, it's normal. We should be drinking the basically breast milk of another species, a bovine species, that is made to grow a tiny little cow into a huge cow very quickly. You know, we, we talk about, yeah, that's normal for us. Camel milk, no thanks. Dog milk, are you kidding me? I'll have another glass of cow's milk though, every day on my cereal. And I realized, well, am I against some types of animal cruelty or all types of animal cruelty? It didn't really make sense to me to pick and choose. Am I against cruelty to the animals that are killed for meat? Am I against cruelty in general that I can avoid? Of course, it only makes sense to have a consistent stance. And that's when I realized, oh man, I think I'm becoming a vegan. <laughs> Which was scary. <laughs> like, holy shit, how did this happen to me? A few months ago, I didn't even like animals. Now I'm becoming one of these vegan extremists. Like, where, I'm just pacing my steps back. Where did I go wrong? Something went really wrong somewhere here. It was the only thing that made sense. I'd always thought vegans were extreme. Probably because one day my friend had come up to me and he said that our mutual friend Grant has gone vegan. I was like, what the hell's vegan? He said, I don't know, man. He doesn't sit on leather couches anymore. <laughs> He used to always sit on couches. That's so strange. <laughs> Vegan. Someone who doesn't consume any animal products. Someone who doesn't support any animal exploitation. Someone who does not support the oppression and the violence that we do to these animals. It means you don't eat them. It means you don't wear them. It means you don't use them for medical testing or use products that contain them. Places that are entertainment for them. We avoid it. You know, we could have gone to the, the, there's probably, I mean, when I used to be on the cruise ships, there was those dolphin, they're in the pools. Mm -hmm. I was there like, oh yeah, that, no, you guys have, I didn't go, like, you guys have a good time. Didn't really see an ethical issue about taking a dolphin from the ocean, from their family, and putting them in a pool, a chlorinated pool, so that we can get selfies with them. Didn't see an issue. <laughs> like, there's a big issue there. And yeah, I thought, well, Vegan is the only thing that makes sense. Since when was it extreme? Everyone sees vegans as extreme. Since when was it extreme to not want to harm animals? Why is that extreme? That's not extreme. The way that I was living is what seemed extreme. <laughs> extremely cruel. Extremely violent. Extremely unnecessary. So like, okay, I've got to be vegan wasn't excited, didn't think I was gonna enjoy it, and I didn't for a while. I had no idea what I was doing. I made a green smoothie one day, and I was so afraid of not getting enough protein, I chopped up a block of tempeh, raw, <laughs> dropped it in. <laughs> okay, I said one day, but that happened for about two weeks. And then I was like, surely there's a better way to vegan. There must be a better way to do this. And then I started looking into recipes. First thing I learned was a banana ice cream recipe blend a few frozen bananas with soy milk. That's the whole recipe. You can make the most delicious ice cream you've ever tasted. 
Why didn't we learn that day one at primary school, little kids' school? That should have been the first. I wish I was. I would have saved myself so much hassle getting in the tub of ice cream. That's so healthy. I started learning that we can have every single meal that you already love, but a vegan version. Vegan burgers, vegan cheese, vegan chocolate, vegan ice cream. I had a vegan steak the other day, and it was the best steak I've ever had. Vegan, you name it, burritos, nachos, whatever. There is a vegan version of all your favorites. You can get the meat, you can get the cheese, you can get the ice cream. If that's not available near you, it doesn't even matter because there's millions of recipes at a click of our fingers away that are easy and simple and healthy with ingredients that you can find anywhere. How incredible is that? How privileged are we to be able to so easily reduce so much violence? Wow, we are empowered because this happens because of us. We create a demand and they fill, the, they fill it with the supply and it can end because of us. As soon as we start doing this, this is how easy it is. This is the funniest thing. You want to go vegan. You're like, how, how am I ever going to do this? You go to the supermarket, same one you already go to. You walk down the aisle, pretty much the same one you already go to. And you go to where the milk's at, you reach for the cow's milk and then you remember that you're not actually a baby cow and you shouldn't be drinking cow's milk. And then you just go like this. It's subtle, but watch. <laughs> That's what we have to do. And the soy milk's right next to it and the almond and the coconut and the hazel milk and the oat milk and all the milks. The plant-based milk section is there's so much good stuff that don't drink that violence and cruelty milk that is also so unhealthy for you and destroys the planet. This what you gotta do. So much more delicious, it's sweeter, it's nice. And there's so many good ones if that's not for your taste. So I'm like, all right, I have to go vegan. I didn't go vegan, I worked on it, I kept doing well and then slipping up and then one day I just said, that's it. I'm tired of these slip ups, which are actual, actually quite deliberate. I don't wanna do that anymore. I'm gonna make a decision, a vow. From this day on, no more. I will not deliberately consume any animal products again. And that same day was the day my vow of silence began. 365 days traveling around Australia, no speaking to raise awareness for the animals and promote peace over violence. Now can someone tell me how long I've got? 10 minutes, oh my Lord, I just started on the vow. See, this is what happens. 18 minutes. I got I got 18 minutes? Okay, a little bit better. A little hurry? It's a whole year, man. It's eventful. All right, so, I start traveling. The first thing I wanted to do was meet the animals that I was raising awareness for. So I go to a sanctuary. I'd never been around a chicken, anything. Only my dog, Bruce, at the time, I didn't even really like Bruce. I was still figuring it out. I was still figuring it out. <laughs> I didn't do it because I was an animal lover, I tell you that much. So I get I get to this sanctuary, this woman's showing me around. Here's Harry the horse, here's Peter the horse. I was like, okay. And voiceless obviously. And then she tells me about all the chickens. Sally, Jasmine, Jemima, there's like 30 of them. I'm going, come on, in my head. Every time I talk, don't worry, I didn't slip up. Okay, actually, I did slip up about four or five times, but they were all accidents. They were all accidents, just so you know. One of them was when I was sleep talking, and I woke up and I'm like, who the hell was that? <laughs> She's telling me all the names. I'm like, how do you know all the names? They all look exactly the same. And why would you name them? They're just chickens. And I mouthed that to her. Like, that's how I was, I was talking like that, trying to, you know, and writing things down. She looked at me like, they're all just chickens, you know? And you know how there's those people who really love cats and they have 45 at home? <laughs> people like that with chickens too. This one of them. Is this the voiceless guy for the animals? Like, what's he talking about? She said they're all individuals. They all have their own thing going on. Sarah, she's so sweet. Give her a pat. She loves it. Stay away from Jasmine. <laughs> She'll rip you to shreds. She doesn't like men. <laughs> Which one was that? Next day, next day, we get a call and someone wanted to deliver a, a baby cow, a male cow, a bobby cow, who had been rescued from slaughter. I thought, wow, this is incredible. I mean, yeah, of course. So they bring this cow in the back of this station wagon. We open up the back and he's in there. He's this big. He's the tiniest cow, just born like a day ago. 
most beautiful, gentle animal. Big, beautiful eyes and eyelashes, just soft, just the cutest thing. And I was, I don't get like that, but I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and then we get him out, and it's a very hot day in Australia. So we're all really hot. This, this, little, this little guy, he's panting, and just looked like he was really struggling. Eyes weren't kind of rolling back, and it wasn't good. And you know, we're really working hard to try to get, get fluids in him and get him healthy and whatever, whatever else we had to do. And this is the first time that I'd ever seen a victim of the dairy industry in real life, not just on YouTube, witnessing it with my own eyes. This is a baby, fresh, fresh from the mother's womb. And his umbilical cord's still hanging there. Like this is a fresh being, a fresh, a fresh member of our family first member of the sentient being family on our earth and he'd just been ripped from his mother and this is what made it real for me because I saw him and I heard that he was on his way to slaughter where all his brothers went and this is the thing about the dairy industry that they don't tell you like yeah it's good for you it's good to get some for calcium not telling you that you can get calcium from so many plants but you don't need to drink milk for it and kill animals and get all those other nasties that come with consuming animal products for your health it's like drink milk for calcium, they give it to kids in school, and this is what's harming us, and it's what's harming them. The dairy industry, in case you don't know, I'm gonna run through it real quick. Firstly, for a cow to give milk, they need to forcibly impregnate, impregnate a cow. They shove an arm into her anus, and then they inject her vagina with bull semen. They, they use the, the arm in the anus to maneuver her cervix. They force a pregnancy on this animal. They restrain her and do this against her will, no consent, arm in, inject with semen. In fact, the worst footage I've ever seen in my life was a cow who had been worked as a milk slave for her whole life and so exhausted she was downed, which means she can't do anything else off to the slaughterhouse. Before they sent her to have her throat cut, they practiced forcibly impregnating her. They, they practiced artificial insemination on her over and over and over and over again. That was the end of her life. Then she got a knife to the throat. That's the dairy industry. The dairy industry that they sell in our supermarkets. How can that even exist? How can that be right next to the soy milk? Such a violent disgrace of a product and disgrace of an industry. They forcibly impregnate them. They give birth. After nine months, just like a human, and then they take the baby away from them almost straight away. And I've seen this happen with my own eyes in Israel. And the mother chased the guy out of there. He put the baby in this, in this wheelbarrow with a cage around and then wheeled him out. And the mother's chasing after. The babies obviously don't know what's going on. They're scared. And the boys, because they'll never produce milk they're sent to slaughter. They're not profitable for an industry that sells milk. They send these baby boys to slaughter. In Australia alone, it's 700,000 roughly male calves every single year. 700,000 babies. They send them to the slaughterhouse, they shoot them in the head with a bolt gun, it pierces their skull and pierces into their brain. It doesn't kill them. And then they get hoisted upside down usually, and then they get their throat cut open. That's usually what happens. That's what they call humane slaughter. The same thing happens to the girls, eventually. First of all, they get treated just like their mother did when they're old enough. Forcibly impregnated, babies taken, used as milk machines, over and over and over, and then they repeat the process. Impregnate them again, take their babies, milk machines, for five to seven years. They do that usually yearly. They can live 20, 25 years old in nature. Five to seven years is all they can do in the dairy industry. After that, they're sent to the slaughterhouse. At the slaughterhouse, They'll be humanely murdered with a shot in the head and they have their throat cut open, just like their baby boys did. That's the dairy issue, that's what happens. Now, if you find a farm where some of those things don't happen, it is not right to take milk from a mother against her will that was made for her baby. And even if it's the most free range organic grass fed operation, and they get belly scratches every day, they all end up at the same slaughterhouse. They all end up there. That's one thing you can never avoid when we're consuming animal products. They're all gonna get slaughtered. Wool, leather, silk, whatever it is, that's where they end up. 
This got me very passionate. I, I spent six weeks with this baby. His name's Rupert. I spent six weeks with him looking after him. And I, I was so cool to finally have an animal that I could spend all this time with and look them in the eyes and realize that this is a someone and not a thing. And that I could make this connection with and see, you know, that they were trying to communicate things. They were trying to tell me things. He was pining for his mother. All he had was me. That was a bit sad. I had a, a plastic jug. I didn't even really like animals that much at this time. This, this rubber teat, and I'm giving him this milk, and I'm like, I got, I'm the best you got. This is sad. It was, it was worse for his rose. Six weeks with him. On the last day, I wanted to say goodbye to him. He's over the other side of the barn. I couldn't talk, so I just tel telepathy, telepathy. I'm like telepathy him. Telepathy. That's what it is. I'm like that doesn't sound right. Telepathy. I'm looking at him, telepathying him. And I was like, Rupert, it's been so good getting to know you over these six weeks. I've learned so much. And I'm so grateful for the experience. You've taught me a lot. It's time for me to go now, but you're in good hands. I'm so sorry about what happened to you and, and your family, but we're working on it. And he's looking at me the whole time. And then he starts walking up to me. And, and the way that he had treated me was different than anyone else, because I was the guy with the milk. So he just always headbutt me. Everyone else would give a pat, lick him, whatever. But me, it's just uh, constant headbutts. That's what they do to their mum. They headbutt their mum's udder to let them know that they want milk. So he's always headbutting me, slobbering on my pants. And my so he starts walking, I'm thinking, oh, here we go. And he comes up, and he does something that he's never done before. Comes up to me, and he starts just nuzzling his head on my leg, just looking up at me. And I was like, Whoa, what's happening here? So I bend down just to see how far I can push it. I'm thinking, I'm going to bend down to pat him and he's just going to knock me over. I bend down. I'm just looking at him. We're looking at each other. I can't, can't believe this happening. I'm thinking, we're having a moment here. <laughs> me and Rupert. And it made me think, whoa, what do we know about animals? We think we know a lot. We do know a lot. We put them in a box, though. They are intelligent in ways we maybe will never be able to comprehend. They are fascinating beings, just like we are. We're all intelligent in our own ways. You know, Einstein's got a good quote that I'm gonna get wrong, but it's something along the lines of, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, he will for his whole life believe that he is stupid. We're all special and different. There's so many incredible tales of animals doing incredible special things, altruistic things, intelligent things, things that can't be explained. It's great. So it made me have a more open idea of who they are, you know, and, and what they're capable of. And I'm not saying that he heard me. He heard me. I'm not saying that he heard me. No, I'm really not saying that. But it just made me go, whoa, that was like he heard me. This is strange. And who knows, maybe they're so connected, they're so much more connected. We're so caught up in all our distractions and our, our thoughts and our ego and our stuff. Maybe they are more connected and maybe they do pick up on energies more and maybe he did come to say goodbye. That's what I'm leaning towards if I'm honest with you. Yeah. Their owner just leaves work and then they run to the door. It's like, calm down, they won't be here for 30 minutes. Yeah. But dogs do weird stuff like that and that's just one example. Okay, how long have I got now? I have an hour. <laughs> Well, let me go back and fill in all the blanks that I rushed through. <laughs> Are you in touch with Rupert still? I, I went to see Rupert once. I was making a video about it. This is a couple of years later. I'm like so excited. Everyone knows the story of Rupert. Can't wait to show everyone. And I get there. I'm like, there he is. And I go up, Rupert, yelling, thinking, not remembering that he did the voice thing. So that probably weirded him out. He's a huge cow by then. And, I, and as he turns his face, his whole face was covered in shit. His whole face. I was like, Rupert, we're, we're gonna make a vlog today, man. We're gonna make a video. Like, you could have at least cleaned up a little. Uh, I'm gonna see him again yeah, this year sometime, actually. So any other time. All right, let me rush through. I start visiting factory farms to see things for myself. I realize the magnitude of it. I realize what a horror show it is. These places are the, the worst of the worst in terms of legal things that exist on this planet. So many innocent beings caged, confined, in pain, suffering, awaiting their execution. It's not good at all. And, and that, again, it, it, it changed me in a way that I realized there's more, sometimes there's 
some things in life that are more important than your own. And I've got so much, and we all do. Look at what we're doing. We are absolutely the top of the top. I felt a, a strong responsibility to dedicate even more of my life to speaking up for those whose voice we don't listen to. My van broke down soon later, and I decided to cycle across Australia, 5,000 kilometers from Darwin to Sydney. No one told me what a bad idea that was. Not one of my friends. So I don't, they're not my friends anymore. This is one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I thought it was gonna be easy. It wasn't that it was hard on my legs so much. I mean, it was at times, but it was my ass, man. My bum. Bum was killing me. Actually, so agonizing, this pain, that constantly, I, I couldn't listen to music, I couldn't enjoy the view. I was just constantly trying to maneuver around the bike, trying to slightly <laughs> reduce my agony. That's actually how it felt. It was very bad. And then one day I found that my spoke broke, part of my bike broke, which I was so happy about, giving me a little bit of a rest. And I'm going through the desert, any rest was welcomed. And I go to this bike shop and there's this bike seat there with this beautiful aura around it. I'm like, whoa, I need to get that, put that on. I think, okay, I can make it now. The reason why I wanted to do this cycle was because I wanted to show people through the journey that you can be healthy and strong and fit and do athletic things on a plant-based diet without consuming any animal products, even in the middle of the desert in Australia. And that's what I did. Somehow, eventually, I made it all the way across Australia. And when I got there, when I got back, I get this email from the Sunrise Morning Show, which is the most popular morning TV show in our show. They said, James, can you speak for the first time on our show? And I was like, no way, because I haven't spoke for a year. I don't even know if my voice is going to work. And I don't want, like, on TV? Nah, nah. I didn't even want to go on the radio to promote my thing before that. So I was really nervous. But I thought, this is one of those times where you need to just step out of your comfort zone for a greater good and just put yourself out there in order to raise awareness for the very thing you took this vow of silence for. So I emailed them back and said, okay, I'm gonna do a 10 day meditation again, figure out exactly what I wanna say, and then I'm gonna go back. And I, I finished my vow of silence, it's about January 13th. I get to their show, I sit there, I sit down, the cameras are on, they say, drum roll please, James, what are your first words gonna be? And I said, I want you to ask me why. And they said, okay, James, why did you do this? And I said, thank you for asking. But it sounded like this, thank you for asking. <laughs> thank you for asking. The reason I took this vow of science was to raise awareness for the voiceless victims of this planet. The animals. We all say we love animals and that we're against animal cruelty. Yet we pay people to mutilate and torture and slaughter animals. And it's not for any necessity. It's not because we need to for our health. It's because we like the way they taste. So I went voiceless because they're voiceless, I thought. But then I realized they're not actually voiceless. They cry in pain and they scream in terror. And when they do that, they're telling us that they're suffering. But the problem is we're not listening because they're covered in feathers or scales or wings or fur. So we don't take their suffering seriously. I also did this vow of science to raise awareness for the way I've been living my life. I'm vegan, which means I don't consume any animal products. I don't support any animal exploitation. And I wanted to show people through my journey how easy that is, how healthy that is, how delicious the food is. And that if you agree that animal cruelty is wrong, that it's also the way that you should be living too. I don't think they were expecting that. I think they thought I was some, you know, like hippie guy who didn't talk for a year, probably didn't wear shoes for the year. And I get on with a very strong animal rights message and I don't recall ever seeing anything like that on TV before. That interview that I, I didn't know if I did a good job, you know, I got out and I was like, what did I just say? Did my voice work? I have no idea what just happened. The interview was seen by millions and millions, and to this day, I've got two million more views on that video in, in the last month. Millions and millions of people saw that. Countless people were inspired to either make changes, moving towards a vegan lifestyle, go vegan, vegetarian to vegan, <laughs> vegans becoming activists. It was a plea to action for every single person, that when we know better, 
we should do better. And when doing better for us is so easy, in fact, just as easy as putting the word vegan in front of a recipe on Google, that's all you gotta do different. How could we not do this? How could we eat any other way? How could we eat any other way when it's so easy and so healthy and so good for the planet and simply just the right thing to do by our fellow earthlings? That was a huge year for me and it propelled things to be where I am today, where I'm giving speeches all around the world. I think it's such an important form of activism, in fact, probably the most important to speak about this and educate people because most people just aren't educated about it. Or they're educated in the wrong way. They've been told all the lies. Meat is good for protein and casting for dairy and humane slaughter and free range and God said this and that. All these things. So I hope that if you came here today and you didn't know some of those things, I hope that you take that quote Seriously, that when we know better, we can do better. Because your choices are the difference between enslavement and freedom, torture and peace, and death and life. It's very, very serious choices as consumers. And we should make conscious choices so that we can increase the peace and make this world a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you.